Last time we met, the Civil War ended. Uh, we know now that the North won. Um, we know now that uh, by as early as 1863, this uh, the, the purpose of the war had become a uh, struggle to end the institution of slavery, in addition to bring the South back into the country. But what comes next is, is a very, very important time period in American history. Uh, it never gets nearly enough attention for a lot of reasons that we don't need to get into. But believe me when I say the process of Reconstruction is a very very important time period in American history. What I want to do is make sure that we're all on the same page, um, and I want to begin with the time period. Let me make sure that you understand that Reconstruction is the period that comes after the Civil War. It comes after the Civil War, and the purpose of Reconstruction is, is I would say, multifaceted. On the one hand, Reconstruction is literal, right? The South is a war zone. It's smoldering rubble, much of it. And part of what the, 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 the Union, what Lincoln is trying to do is he's trying to literally rebuild it. The other part is metaphoric, right? Um, a lot of historians, myself included, consider the Civil War to be America's unfinished business. Um, we got halfway there in the American Revolution, uh, a country where you didn't have to be born into a wealthy family, into a... Uh, noble, notable family, if you were talented, if you were, you know, hardworking, um, you could you could rise as high as your talents would take you. That was halfway there. But we preserved America's original sin, which was the institution of slavery. So it's going to take a civil war to end the institution of slavery, and that's why we consider it America's unfinished business. Um, anyway, here's the big problem when it comes to Reconstruction. The Constitution doesn't say who's in charge. It's entirely silent. And part of the reason that it's silent is that the Founding Fathers never thought that their sons and grandsons would be stupid enough to screw up this great republic. And so it had an envisioned civil war. And the result of that is that you're going to see Congress butting heads with the president, and not just Abraham Lincoln, but they're continuing to butt heads with the president when it comes to the scope uh, the range, and very generally, who, who's in charge? Who, who takes the lead when it comes to rebuilding the country? Um, I want to want to make sure that you know who's on what team. There's really three schools of thought on this. There's the conservative approach. Now, all of these are northerners, right? Northern politicians. But and I know this is going to sound strange, but in in the 1860s, if you were a conservative, that made you a Democrat. And the conservative Democrat approach is to make Reconstruction very, very quickly. You want to make it as quickly as humanly possible. Uh, they want to get back to business as usual, bring the South back in. They're not overly concerned about, you know, meeting benchmarks or making sure that the pre-war leadership didn't reemerge in the aftermath of the wars if nothing happened. Um, and they're very unconcerned with respect to what ought to happen to the newly freed slaves. You've got your moderate Republicans. Lincoln's a moderate. These people understand that you've got to be quick with Reconstruction. You cannot drag your feet, but there's certain things that need to make make, make your to-do list. One of them is to make sure that the people that led the South into the war don't re-emerge as, as the post-war leadership. And so one of the things that these moderates wanted was to make every state's re-entrance requirement encompass a 10% loyalty oath, right? 10% of each Confederate state's adult white male population would have to take this loyalty oath, proclaiming secession to be illegal and vowing its undying loyalty to the Union. Might not sound like a big deal, but if you just fought against the North for four and a half years, that might stick in your craw a little bit when it comes to resentment. And then, of course, there's the radicals. We've talked about these guys. They are the abolitionists become politicians, right? These are the people that want to punish the South for seceding in the first place. They want to take Southern land, um, the land of these ex-Confederate military and political leaders. They want to chop it apart and dole it out to newly freed slaves so that the slaves have a means of supporting themselves in the aftermath of the war. They want to permanently revoke the citizenship rights, including the right to vote, 
of all of these people that led armies and led political bodies. They want to more or less remove the citizenship rights broadly defined of these ex-Confederate leaders. And they're more than happy to leave the Union troops in the South as an occupational force for as long as it takes to protect the slaves, right, the ex-slaves that is, uh, or to, to completely change hearts and minds, and it doesn't matter how long it takes to the radical Republicans. So, as you can see, guys, you, you've got three very different schools of thought. Now, let me demonstrate how and why this is such tough, tough business. If you're following along in the PowerPoint presentation with me, you're, you're looking at a picture of Abraham Lincoln. This happens to be my favorite picture of Abraham Lincoln. And the reason that it's one of my favorites is because he's kind of smiling. He's got a little smirk on his face. Many of you are probably thinking, so what, right? I mean, we've got cameras on our phones. You can take a camera basically whenever, wherever you want to go. Um, the thing of it was, in the 1860s, photography was more or less a new invention. Let's just say a lot of the bugs hadn't gotten worked out yet. What I mean by that is, for the most part, you'd have to sit for at least 45 seconds to, uh, to take your picture. And as you might imagine, it's difficult to hold that pose for 45 seconds, let alone anything longer than that. And so what you got here is Lincoln in a very candid moment of reflection. It looks as if the world's been taken, or the, the weight of the world has been taken off of his shoulders. It's probably because it had, right? He'd been anguishing for, for more than four years. And, and finally, in the blink of an eye, it was over. It's just got him just kind of letting off a little bit of steam, so to speak. This... Um, this pleasant mood didn't last very long. Um, in the aftermath of the war, Lincoln took his wife, Mary Todd, to, to the theater, to Ford's Theater in Washington. They went to go see a comedy, uh, Our American Cousins. And um, one of the men that was in the theater that night was a um, assassin with Southern loyalties, John Wilkes Booth held Lincoln personally responsible for destroying what he considered to be the Southern way of life. Lincoln and his wife were seated in the balcony. Booth snuck up behind him, um, shot him in the back of the head, and, and, and assassinated Abraham Lincoln. You have to understand what a massive, massive loss this is. I mean, first of all, the shock of the president being assassinated, that, that's huge, huge in, in and of itself. This happening in the aftermath of the Civil War, Lincoln was our one, one good chance to come back together and heal and now he's gone. More importantly, the guy that we get in his stead is maybe the worst president in American history, arguably anyway. Of course, I'm talking about Andrew Johnson. Andrew Johnson was a Democrat, and not just a Democrat, but a Southern Democrat. He was from Tennessee. He hated slavery, but what I mean by that is he hated slave owners. He didn't really care so much about African Americans, if you understand what I'm saying. So, Johnson, a Southern Democrat, was added to Lincoln's um, ticket as his running mate in 1864, primarily to balance out Lincoln's ticket, to reach out to traditional Democratic voters, to people that might be a little bit hesitant to vote for Lincoln again or vote for him, period. And it worked, or at least, you know, it didn't work against him. But the thing of it is, in 1864, nobody, including Lincoln himself, thought that he was going to be assassinated. They didn't realize that when you took Johnson, what you got is Johnson, right? And one of the things that you need to understand about Johnson is that he's really going to take charge when it comes to Reconstruction. And what he's going to say is that the Constitution doesn't say this in, in black and white terminology, but it does imply that Reconstruction is the prerogative of the president. And in 1865, Johnson delivers his version of Reconstruction, okay? Initially, the Republicans are not really all that mad about his version of Reconstruction. They're okay with it. On the surface level, there seemed to be pretty strict provisions for getting back in. Um, you had to accept the 13th Amendment. Uh, the 13th Amendment is going to be the, the, um, the, the law that will end slavery in this nation. Um, 
really the first, last, and only reference to the institution of slavery is, is the 13th Amendment, as far as the Constitution is concerned, and, and it says that slavery in the United States is illegal. Johnston is proclaiming that for, for Virginia, for example, to get back in, it would have to ratify the 13th Amendment and accept that slavery was gone. It also, at least on paper, had pretty strict requirements for these ex-Confederates for getting back in. But here's the problem. Here's the realities. The reality is Johnson's bark was far worse than his bite, right? He talked a good game, but when it comes to actually delivering, he really didn't. And one thing in particular that I need you to be mindful of is that Johnson is going to forgive these ex-Confederates. And what I mean by that is he is going to restore their citizenship rights in full. They're going to have equal protection under the law. They can vote. They can run for office. They can hold office. All the rights and privileges that they enjoyed before the war, they will enjoy in the aftermath of the war as well. And so on the one hand, what this does is it raises the possibility you might even say probability that the people that issued the ordinances of secession, those are going to be the same people coming back to Washington as if the Civil War just never really happened. The other thing that this does, these very light slaps on the wrist for getting back into the country, they're going to lead to these things called black codes. What the black codes are, are basically two things. Number one, they're designed to restore slavery in everything but name, right? It's slavery, it's the it's the race-based caste system that had existed in the South before the war. It's just being called something different. I'll give you an example that helps to elaborate that in a second. But for right now, I also need you to understand that these black codes restore the white supremacy doctrine of the South the black codes made black subservience to white. Here's how. Part of these codes were legal codes, and they defined what somebody of the African-American background uh, could be arrested for, which in short order was basically anything. Insulting gestures, you look at somebody cross-eyed, that's a crime. Uh, cruel treatment to animals, you don't hook up your horse right, that, that's a crime. Um, you're exercising the minister of a gospel, but if you're not doing so with some license from a regularly organized church, that's a crime and you can be arrested. And for all of these crimes, you can be fined up to $100. Uh, the most common fine was about 10 which is not that much today. But keep in mind, the, the Union Army in 1863 was only paying its guys $13 per month. So $10 is a lot of money. And what's going to happen if you can't pay that fine is somebody's going to come down to the jail cell and they'll pay it for you. Now, that person that's doing that is not doing that out of the kindness of his heart. As a matter of fact, the person that's doing that very well might have owned you a few weeks earlier. What this is going to do is it's going to give them the opportunity to say, you now work for me, you're going to work off this $10, and you're going to be done when I say that you're done, right? So the Black Codes are, are going to be a huge failure of the Johnson administration, and it's, it's also going to prove to be a thorn in the side of Reconstruction as a process really throughout the entire time period. That, that's really going to be one of those linchpins um, that progress will live and die on. But the other problem that, that Johnson has, has basically given rise to is that there are elections that are being held after these southern states have met Johnson's requirements for getting back in. They've, they've ratified the 13th Amendment right alongside their black codes, restoring slavery in all but name. And the people that several years earlier had issued ordinances of secession, they're, they're now showing up in Washington ready to legislate once again. Fortunately for Northern politicians, there's a constitutional provision that says that Congress gets to be the judge of its elections, returns, and the qualifications of its own members. What that means is if a state elects somebody that's a convicted felon, the Congress, the Senate, do not have to accept them simply because the people of that state voted them in. What Congress can say is, nope we're not accepting you, and you can tell the good people of the state, wherever it is that we're talking about, that they need to go back, and they need to do it again, get it right this time. And so what these northern politicians do is they send these newly elected southern congressmen and senators, send them back. They say, go back, 
go back to Virginia, we're not ready for you yet, and we'll let you know when we are. What Congress is desperately trying to do is they're trying to clean up the mess that Johnson has created. And they're going to do so in two very specific examples. One, they're going to establish freedmen's bureaus all across the South. What these bureaus are designed to do is to set up African Americans um, politically, socially, culturally, and certainly economically. The Freedmen's Bureau was a way to acculturate this ex-slave population into freedom. This was a very important and a very difficult, maybe, maybe difficult is the wrong word to use, but it was not a slam dunk. It was not an easy transition. That's where the Freedmen's Bureau came in. The other thing that Congress is going to do is it's going to put a little bit of punch behind the African-American community. The Civil Rights Bill of 1866 will, will establish civil rights for these newly freed slaves. It will provide them with some protection under the laws, and it will oblige the individual states for carrying out and executing those laws. So there is some reason to be a bit optimistic here, but again, Johnson's clearly a problem. He's actively encouraging these southern states not to cooperate, to openly resist measures like the Freedmen's Bureau, like the Civil Rights Bill, right? Told, told the South not to ratify it, right? What you're going to see here from 1867 forward is the Republicans, the radical Republicans, are going to take the charge when it comes to leading uh, the Reconstruction process. Now, we've met these guys before. You know that the guy with the big uh, pork chop sideburns there on the left, that's Charles Sumner. He's the leader of the radicals in the uh, Senate. And his colleague to the right, uh, Thaddeus Stevens, was played by the actor Tommy Lee Jones in the film Lincoln. Uh, that Thaddeus Stevens might sound a bit familiar to you. In any case, he's from Pennsylvania, and he's going to be the leader in the House of Representatives of the radicals. Also keep in mind, these are people that wanted to elevate the status of African Americans, not just abolish slavery, but a, a, a elevate their status socially and politically to being equal to whites. That's, in fact, what made them radical, was that they wanted equality, and they wanted that equality to extend to the former slave population. The way that they're going to gather momentum is going to be through a process that historians call waving the bloody shirt. Um, I want you to picture a Mercedes-Benz symbol for a second. Almost looks like a peace symbol, you know, but without the circle, of course, right? Remove that circle in your mind. If you were stuck with a bayonet, if you got stabbed with a bayonet, big long knife on the end of a gun, that's what that wound would have looked like. A lot of hand-to-hand -hand combat in the Civil War. Um, you're going to need a way to defend yourself in situations like this. And what better way than a knife at the end of your, your, your musket, or excuse me, your rifle. Anyway, the, the problem with this is essentially if you get stuck like that, that's a three-prong wound, and it's almost impossible to treat. And so if you get stabbed with one of these bayonets, there's a very good chance that you're going to bleed to death. Um, if you got shot in the arm, they would have, the only way that they could guarantee that infection didn't infect your whole body was to lop off the arm, um, amputate it, except they didn't generally use anesthesia. If you were an officer, maybe they gave you some morphine, but if you were just a regular grunt, you got a spoon to bite down hard on, maybe a shot of whiskey or two, and they would just take a hacksaw to you. And so you can only imagine the resentment of some of these Civil War vets that, you know, came home armless or legless, came home at, at the very least emotionally scarred from what they had witnessed in the last four plus years. And, and now they're beginning to learn that the South is coming back and they're, and they're trying to be bullies here. They're, they're trying to push around congressmen. You lost the war, right? And, and you're not going to make the rules, not in the aftermath of this, right? Losing has consequences. And this is what I mean when I say waving the bloody shirt. These radical Republicans are, are actively playing upon northern resentment. And they're using that resentment to help build political momentum to introduce radical reconstruction. Now, for your notes, radical reconstruction would be entailed in the Reconstruction Bill of 1867.
right? What this reconstruction bill is going to do is it's going to set new requirements, more strict requirements for re-entry into the country. It's not going to be the Johnson slap on the wrist sort of treatment, okay? Um, there is going to be some serious uh, uh, considerations that will be given to these newly freed African Americans um, that, that used to be slaves. Johnson's response is less than enthusiastic. Again, he's encouraging anybody willing to listen to him that um, they should actively not participate in this, right? Johnson's a problem. And the Republicans knew that he was a problem, which is why, in addition to the uh, Reconstruction Bill, they, they also had a law, it comes out the same year, the Tenure of Office Act. Tenure of Office Act is designed to do two things. You ready? One. It's designed to protect Lincoln's old cabinet, right? His Secretary of State. It's especially designed to protect the Secretary of War, Edwin Stanton. And it's designed to protect them from being fired by Johnson. We know that Johnson's not a Republican. We know that Johnson's not a big fan of Reconstruction. And we know that one of the only things that is standing in between Johnson stopping the process altogether and this meaning something would be Lincoln's former cabinet. So the Tenure of Office Act is designed to protect those individuals that used to be advisors to Abraham Lincoln. Um, the other thing it's designed to do is to catch Andrew Jackson in a trap. Or excuse me, Andrew Johnson. Johnson's not the, uh, the, the brightest bulb in the chandelier, he's just not. And in March 1868, he, he in fact does fire the Secretary of War, Edwin Stanton, and the House of Representatives knows that he's just broken the law, and that's an impeachable offense. They introduce articles of impeachment. Johnson will go on trial in the Senate. Keep in mind, just because you're impeached doesn't mean that you're removed from office. You have to be convicted in the Senate, in the upper house. The Senate came one vote away from removing him from office. One vote. Now, is he removed? No. He wasn't removed, but what, what the Republicans got was the next best thing, and what they got was the defanging of him, right? Um, they had taken his teeth out when it comes to his ability to resist Reconstruction. He's going to be powerless to resist. He, this is a huge, huge scandal, right? And it's one that his presidency would never recover from. He's a deeply unpopular president. He's not going to be renominated by either the Democrats or the Republicans in 1868. And it's going to pave the way for the election of, well, let's be honest, a military hero, right? We know that that's one of our favorite things to do is to elect military heroes. And nowhere, anywhere, was there a bigger military hero in 1868 than that of U.S. Grant, right? U.S. Grant is going to be the Republican nominee in 1868. Now, as you can see, U.S. Grant does bear a striking resemblance to my grandmother's dog, Snuggles. A little bit of good-natured humor here as we wind down the semester, but in any case, it's also true. Anyway, Grant does about as well as Lincoln did when it comes to the popular vote in the Electoral College. He wins convincingly in 1868. But more importantly, just like Lincoln's re-election meant that the war would be fought to a conclusive end, Grant's election re uh, guaranteed that Reconstruction would continue, at least for the next four years, right? Grant's election guarantees the continuation of Reconstruction. And there's two major pieces of legislation that I need you to be mindful of to that end, and one would be the 14th Amendment. The 14th Amendment is going to give anybody born or naturalized in the United States citizenship rights and equal protection under the law. It really is that simple. Anybody born here or naturalized here is a U.S. citizen and all the rights and privileges that are entailed in that. It's also designed to overturn something. I want you to think back to the Dred Scott decision. We know that the Dred Scott decision in 1857 legally proclaimed that African Americans were not citizens, that they were property. What the 14th Amendment is designed to do is to overturn the Dred Scott decision that because blacks were born in this country, they were now citizens. Dred Scott is overturned. 
it also obliges the state of Mississippi, the state of Virginia, the state of Alabama, Florida, etc., to enforce those rights. The state has an obligation to protect their life, their liberty, and their property according to the 14th Amendment. What makes you think that they're going to do that, right? I mean, a few years earlier, they were literally referring to these people as property. What makes you think that they're just going to start doing this out of the goodness of their heart? And the simple answer to that would be the 15th Amendment, right? For your notes, guys, what the 15th Amendment does is it is it gives black men, emphasis on the word man, the right to vote. Um, this is essentially going to be the political teeth that Congress is going to give the African-American community. If Mississippi doesn't protect your life, your liberty, your, 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 your property, then you can vote these guys out of office. Um, if you make enough of these people mad, right, they're, they're not going to vote for you in your re-election and you're going to find yourself in the losing end of that battle. So that's the political teeth that, that, that radical reconstruction is going to provide to the African-American community. Now, one thing before we go any further, one of the biggest groups to oppose the 15th Amendment, not, not who you're thinking, right? It's not um, racists per se. Um, it, it, it's not even ex-Confederates. It's actually women, right? And, and, and progressive, former abolitionist women, people like uh, Elizabeth Cady Stanton, who said if you put the word man in the Constitution, it's going to take us 100 years to get it out. Um, it didn't. It didn't take them 100 years. It only took them like 80 years. But as you can see, that's a prediction that turned out to be relatively true in the sense that, um, you know, uh, the, the, the word man had this lasting effect and, and women are not going to get the right to vote until late 1920, right? Anyway, this is going to be the last piece, the last major piece of civil rights legislation. And, and truth be told, we're, we're not going to see that. For those of you that go on to take modern American history, you're not going to see that uh, for, for approximately in the next century, right? It's not going to be until the 1960s and the civil rights movement uh, that you're going to see real, meaningful civil rights reform. Um, but this is bearing fruit. This is white unionists, uh, white Republicans is who we mean. African Americans, um, they're going to elect Republican officials all over the South. Um, Jefferson Davis, the former president of the Confederate States of America, one time senator from Mississippi, his seat in the Senate would be occupied by an African American politician. But it didn't just stop at these really big, high profile positions. Black superintendents, um, black um, local officials, um, more African American political rule in the South, some 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 real honest to goodness self determination. They set up schools and equipped them with competent teachers. Uh, keep in mind, uh, the, the South had a very different understanding of schooling and who ought to be going to school, uh, as opposed to what you would have seen in a place like Massachusetts. There were provisions for women. Um, there was a flood of money that rebuilt the South's infrastructure. It, it brought it into the 19th century, you'd say, in, in the sense that you see transportation networks begin to emerge across the South, a real honest-to-goodness railroad system, and not just one that was you know, lining uh, up all of the major cotton producers so that they would be able to get their cotton to market much, much easier. This is a very realistic version of transportation infrastructure. The one really big challenge that Republicans are just not going to have an answer for, and that, that's going to be sharecropping. Um, sharecropping is going to be the way that most former slaves are going to make their living in the aftermath of the war. Let's be honest, right? Most of these people were farmers. That's what they did. That, that's the only thing that they've ever known. That they, they were used in the production of cotton primarily. And what you're going to need, if, if you're going to be a farmer, you're going to need some land. Well, think back about this. When Andrew Jackson forgave all of those ex-Confederates, the, the North is not able, the Union's not able to, to confiscate their property, not without due process anyway, right? You can't just take somebody's property. And so without land, without the ability to dole out land, there's not really going to be a whole lot of opportunity to to transition these former slaves, economically speaking. 
Sharecropping is a process whereby the former slave owner needs labor. And you, the former slave, you, you, you need a way to make money. And so as you can see, the dots begin to be connected. Slave owner needs manpower, you need, you need land to work on. He agrees to allow you to work on a plot of his land. And at the end of the season, you'll share the harvest. He's going to take 80%, you'll take 20%. No, it's not fair. Of course it's not fair, right? But it's the best deal that you've got on offer. So of course you're going to take it. But it doesn't stop there. You need seed. You need plows. You need other equipment. You need labor, right? You've got a lot of needs and, and absolutely no money. So what you do is you mortgage this, this fall's harvest to, to, to be able to buy all of those right now presently needed commodities. The only problem with that is you're basically speculating on the value of your, of your harvest. You're, you're guessing this is what you're going to make and, and this is what you need to do to cover that, that, that mortgaged crop. And if you've ever gone shopping when you're out of money, you'll know, A, that's a really terrible idea, and B, I mean, it never works out the way that you anticipate right? It's always a bad idea. And ultimately what you're going to see is a situation where you never quite make enough to break even. So you got to mortgage next year's crop. And next year you never quite make enough to break even. So you begin to see this vicious cycle of debt peonage emerge. For your notes, part of the reason that sharecropping is so, you know, problematic is on the one hand it's going to tie people to the land same way that slavery had. And on the other hand, it's going to be a source of poverty. It's going to institutionalize poverty in a way. I mean, when most people think about a lack of civil rights, Jim Crow discrimination, um, they think violence, that the system was held in place by violence. They're right. Certainly violence was a big, big part of this. But it's also poverty. Po poverty that is that often neglected shackle uh, that chains people into an impoverished state, but it's a very, very important shackle that you need to be mindful of. And this, sharecropping, is going to be one of the future challenges that Republicans and other lawmakers are going to have moving forward. And that is where we'll pick it up the next time we meet.